Hello and welcome to another Overlord Law video and today we are going to take a look at Draudilon Auriculus, the Queen of the Dragon Kingdom and one of the actual smartest and best people in charge in the entire new world. Let's take a look at this map from volume 9 after I added some borders in order to get a rough idea where all of this is even taking place and the Dragon Kingdom is close to the theocracy but also to the border of the Beastman nation which is off the map and it is currently in great danger of simply being overrun by the Beastman currently invading it and overseeing this mess is Draudilon, the grandchild of Brightness Dragonlord, one of the very few remaining Dragonlords. Now you might say, wait a minute, this isn't Draudilon, this is Noe. And yes you would be correct, because we don't have a picture of her yet, so I used Noe instead. A dragon from Fire Emblem and also Myr and Ena from older Fire Emblem games where people used to actually wear clothes for some reason. Weird, right? But still I think that these depictions would match her appearance, at least in my opinion, to a certain degree. And with that said, the daughter of the Dragon Lord should also have been in season 3 though. But sadly she wasn't and with season 4 only truly touching upon the Empire, the Sorcerer and the Dwarven Kingdom. We also likely won't see her in either of these episodes and parts of the season. And since the 15th novel will deal with Sashi and the Elves in general, it is also likely that we won't see Draudilon in it at all. So I figured I'm doing her lore video now, rather than just waiting 5 more years or so. And with that said, let's continue. Draudilon grew up with her great grandfather actually around and Brightness taught her about wild magic and what it is, how to use it and how very dangerous it could be. And it seems to be that the definition of whatever constitutes a true dragon lord or not is not so much the dragon part, although that is related, but the ability to actually use wild magic. But with that said, Draudilon is only the great grandchild of Brightness and her diluted bloodline, or far more likely her tiny soul, is simply incapable of controlling wild magic and it greatly limits her ability to both use and control it properly. But still with all of that said, Draudilon has not only learned an ultimate move from her grandfather that could in theory wipe out the entire invading beastman armies or if she miscasts her own population, but also she knows about the ultimate techniques of Platinum and the other true dragon lords. But even with this knowledge, Draudilon lacks the means to cast such a potent technique, even if she would know how to control it, since it would require a million souls just to fuel the spell. And since she can't control her own wild magic abilities properly, she is not only known as a true but also as a false dragon lord. But still, she retains some abilities and blessings that came from her bloodline. While her body is no stronger than that of an ordinary woman, she can transform herself from, as Emperor Jurgniff had put it, an old hag to a sweet and innocent child. And since Draudilon Auriculus is also a very able politician, she uses her ability to her advantage by pretending to be just a child, her enemies will underestimate her. And protecting her, and by extent her nation, will also be something that all sexes and age groups can agree upon. Although this attracts a bit too much of unwanted attention from a certain adventurer. But the last thing Draudilon Auriculus in her dire situation is able to afford is domestic politics getting out of hand, and at worst, the court splitting into very hostile factions like it happened in the kingdom. In any way Draudilon is also still very able to govern her nation and to do so with more competence than Prince Zanek would, but also somewhat less than that of the Emperor Jerknuf would have been, who by the way really dislikes her, if not as much as he does Renner, so this might become important. Now with that said I'm not going to go over the potential use all of this intel has if Einzelgon could acquire it. 
for I already made a video about it. Link to it in the description. Instead I'm going to ask a very obvious question, but also one that nobody yet has seemed to think of. If Draudio Noriculus is Brightness Dragonlord's great granddaughter, then what has happened to her mother, her grandmother, and her great grandmother, of whom at least two should be able to use wild magic? Far, far better than Draudilon herself. Now, since Draudilon's body is no stronger than that of a normal, ordinary woman, and since at least one form of hers ages normally, and since the nation is not for the first time at war with the beastmen, it could be that her parents and even her grandparents might have simply perished to protect all of it. And only Draudilon now remains. Or perhaps they are out there, somewhere, or even still with brightness. Also Brightness Dragonlord, despite teaching her in her youth, and despite likely also establishing the Dragon Kingdom in the turbulent period that followed the end of the evil gods 200 years ago, isn't there to help his great granddaughter in her hour of need. Despite him being more than capable to utterly crush the Beastman nation. So, why is that? Maybe Draudion's parents are still with brightness as well as her grandparents, since they are far more able to use wild magic than her. Or maybe the entire Dragon Kingdom was just something akin to the Arkland Council State, where new worlders are also fought wild magic. Maybe Brightness wanted to test how many generations it takes for his blood to dilute, to the point that even with the knowledge of how to use it, fought by him, his offspring wouldn't be able to use it properly anymore. I mean, after the invasion of the Eight Creed Kings and the, from Brightness point of view, recent incursion of the evil spirits, it could be that he also now tries to gain more and more power by recruiting with his other tail. And he's just working out some kings or so. Though again, all of this is pure speculation. And for now, we simply have to wait and see what will happen if this particular plotline should continue in the future. We are going to take a look at a country's decision that thus far has mostly been foreshadowed and only directly been given screen time once. So during Overlord's 14th volume, a couple of states that, at least thus far, aren't the Sorcerer Kingdom, welcomed the new Overlord's decision to declare war against the Kingdom of Riestais. Among them were the Empire, because it is already a tributary state, the Dwarven Kingdom, because Ein saved it, the Holy Kingdom, because apparently Nea Barayar is in charge now, at least to the extent of being able to heavily influence foreign policies and being able to sign off on one of the most important paperworks in the history of the kingdom. And most curious, the Dragon Kingdom. Now this is a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. At least as far as Eins is concerned, because it means that his kingdom and the action it was about to commit received approval. And ever since the expedition to the Dwarven Kingdom, it should be clear that Eins craves this recognition of his own realm. But of course the question then is, why did Drowlicon Auriculus, one of the most experienced regions in this part of the new world, sided with an undead overlord? And I believe the answer is fairly simple at first. Her home country is invaded by beast mandemic humans, who are much stronger than the normal humans. And the war thus far is a catastrophe, with several big cities already being occupied by the invaders, who likely invaded in order to devour the humans of the Dragon Kingdom. To them it is not a war of occupation, it is dinner. And since the entire population of the Dragon Kingdom is already in the process of being wiped out completely by an incoming invader, Draudicon has precious little to lose if she decides to side with the Sorcerer Kingdom, especially because her own realm would normally receive one of the scriptures in order to help the Dragon Kingdom repel incoming invaders. And it is also in the practical and in the religious interest of the slain theocracy to protect humans from beastmen invaders. 
But this time the aid didn't came. Despite the money Draudicon Euryclus had promised, already been paid. So if she has already been abandoned by the slain theocracy, she has also nothing to lose politically if she decided to side with the Sorcerer Kingdom of Ein Sol Gaon. Especially because so far the Sorcerer King had been willing to personally aid the Holy Kingdom, in spite of the stark difference in opinion about undead beings and their role in society between the two unlikely allies. Simply speaking, if the Sorcerer King repelled the Aldebaut, the Demon Emperor alongside his demi-human forces, despite the Holy Kingdom hating the undead with quite the passion, the cunning Draudicon Auriculus likely reasoned that the Sorcerer King might help her repel the demi-humans currently invading and devouring the Dragon Kingdom. Because they are by comparison much weaker, that they lack a strong and powerful leader, and that the population of the Dragon Kingdom is not as zealous and therefore not as opposed to the undead as the Holy Kingdom's populace was. But, and I have to stress this again, Draudicon is fairly wise and experienced, and therefore she should also have noticed that, suddenly and very uncharacteristic of the Holy Kingdom, an undead worshipping cult has sprung up, which is currently taking over the country, especially its northern half, and the blind evangelist are now portraying the Sorcerer King as justice, therefore basically overthrowing the worldly order and the previously established religious doctrine. And if this land, so hostile to the undead, could be completely transformed and shaped towards the Sorcerer Kingdom's needs, then Draudlikon likely realized that this could happen much easier in her own country. Furthermore, Auriculus should, also at least by now, have a bad feeling about how the Sorcerer Kingdom wages an all-out war, considering what happened to King and Country after the first undead crossed the border. But maybe this is simply the price she has to pay in order to get her people saved, giving up her crown to a puppet of the Sorcerer King in exchange for having the Sorcerer King's forces roll over the Beastman armies like they did over Rias Tizer's forces two times already. Or perhaps Auriculus is hoping for the same status that the Empire of Baharut has nowadays, becoming a tributary state that is ultimately subservient to the Sorcerer Kingdom, that has to adapt to the Sorcerer Kingdom's laws and regulations, in exchange for being protected by the undead armies and being given humanitarian aid, like the Holy Kingdom received. And this is something that the Dragon Kingdom will actually need in order to rebuild. Or, and this is just my personal favorite among these theories, Draudicon Euryclus noticed how obsessed the Sorcerer King is with magic, taking Fluter Paradine as his apprentice and collecting the demon maids of Yaldabaut. I mean, he calls himself the Sorcerer King after all. So what better bargaining ship Auriculus has than her own lineage? Because as a descendant of the Brightness Dragonlord, she is capable of casting wild magic or the magic of the soul, and she herself stated that she would be able to use the powerful wild magic attacks of her ancestor, but that she also would need a million souls to sacrifice for it, since her own wild magic is much weaker than that of a proper dragon lord. But luckily Einzel Gaun has already reobtained the demon statue, which contained three jewels, with Armageddon evil in it. And weaker demons were oftentimes used as sacrifices, to fuel spells or rituals, because they had already the tendency of going rogue, even back in Yggdrasil. And looking at this deal from the other side of the table, maybe having Draudicon demonstrating her wild magic power by using weaker demons as sacrifices to fuel her own spell, is maybe part of the Sorcerer King's 10,000 year long plan. Anyway, if I were the Beastman army now, I would turn around and run as far east as my legs could carry me. Because the Sorcerer King might take a personal interest in the wild magic demonstration, though I doubt that all of this will happen in the next volume. And with that said, I say thank you very much for watching and special thanks to